welcome back to my channel. So today's video is a highly requested video. Um, someone at CrimeCon did come up to me and speak to me about this particular case, but I was already familiar with it because a lot of you have suggested talking about Bardstown, Kentucky and everything that's going on in that particular town slash Nelson County in general. If you're not aware of it, there was a pretty large string of unsolved murders and one disappearance and the disappearance is what I'm going to be speaking about today. There's a lot of speculations revolving around the Bardstown murders, is what they call them, and this, like I said, missing person. And everyone's very interested in this and wants to see my take on it. So I will say, as I've said already three times, hello too much caffeine today, but I'm only talking about the missing persons case today and I would love to do kind of like an entire series on this where I speak about all the other murders. I do speak on one of them in this case because it is for sure probably related. Um, so if you guys want to see the other unsolved murders, I can make videos on those. I know I used to make a lot of unsolved murder videos, but I have not in a very, very long time. Enough of the rambling. So today's story, we're talking about Crystal Rogers, and this case is a wild ride. I listened to hours of interrogation footage. It's one of those where there's a pretty good chance that they know what happened and who did it. It's just kind of solving it and I feel like I've been covering a lot of those lately um, but I'm interested to hear your take on it because you guys know I try to look at both sides of the story and can something easily be explained you know because of just coincidences or other circumstances that we're just not seeing and I'm very interested to see if you guys can pick up on any of that in this case because everything seems pretty suspicious and sketchy in my personal opinion. Crystal Rogers was 35 years old when she went missing on well Technically, she was last seen on July 3rd of 2015, but she was reported missing on July 5th of 2015. So Crystal was a beautiful young mother of five children, and they were ranging in age, and her youngest was with her most recent boyfriend, Brooks Howe. So Crystal, unfortunately, was not the first person in her family to ever go missing. Back in 1979, I think it was, her Aunt Sherry actually went missing under very similar-ish circumstances. Also, on top of this, Crystal would not be the last bit of tragedy to strike this family either. So now we're going to get on to what happened with Crystal. So as I said, Crystal was in a relationship with a man named Brooks Houck, and they had a young son together, and at the time she went missing, he was around two and a half years old, almost three. The last day Crystal was seen was on Friday the 3rd. That day she did go to Walmart with a few of her children, and she showed houses because Brooks had a rental company situation going on. He had multiple different rental houses houses and you know while he took care of the upkeep side of everything and you know made sure all the houses were taken care of crystal was the one who did a lot of the background work she would show these houses out to potential renters she dealt with listing them and you know keeping updated on all the paperwork side of things so that day she did go out and show a few of the houses brooks and crystal did live together on glenview drive but they planned on having an adult night and as a parent i get that a lot you know, we will go out for a date night, we will send the kids somewhere else to have a night together because Parents love their children, but it's nice to just kind of have a night where you don't have to worry about it. And from what I saw, they didn't get that very often. She stayed at home most of the time. She had odd jobs here and there, but they had five children. All of them were not Brooke's children, but they all were Crystal's. And I don't think custody was... Um, a very set thing for her from what I kind of got from different interviews. I kind of, she kept them, I'm pretty sure, most of the time and then sent them off to the other fathers when they wanted to see their kids. So for the most part, it seemed like she had her children most of the time. So there's a lot of confusion in regards to this babysitter that night because of other reasons, again, that I'll get into later. But from what they see the day of, Crystal was texting one of her friends. The friend asked for her to bring the children to Chuck E. Cheese, and she told them she was actually getting a babysitter that night and sending some of the older children off with their father. 
in order to have this date night with Brooks and she seemed really excited about it. That's where the night left off. She went to Walmart, showed some houses, children were dropped off with their father and the little boy, the two and a half year old was supposed to get a babysitter and her and Brooks were having a night together. But on the next day, July 4th, Crystal's family couldn't get in touch with her, and I don't think this was incredibly uncommon, obviously, for anyone to not really answer or respond to your phone calls and at least not reply back with a text at this day and age is kind of odd for pretty much everyone, but, you know, I think most people knew she maybe was having a date night, they had plans, it was the 4th of July, there was a barbecue that Brooks and Crystal were set to go to, I think it was someone on Brooks' side of the family. So it's a busy day, it's not, you know, that out of character for people to not respond to text messages, usually people are drinking on the 4th of July, people are outside, they're just not with their phone. So that day came and went and nothing, and also keep in mind, Brooks had never contacted Crystal's family to say anything was wrong, so they just assumed she was okay. But then on the 5th, no one had heard from Crystal. And at this point, and again, I can't confirm any of this, but Brooks says that he called someone in the family and, you know, he didn't know where she was, they didn't know where she was, so they all kind of realized on the 5th, I think, and again, timelines are wacko in this, that Crystal hadn't been seen by anyone since the 3rd, apparently. So sometime during the early morning afternoon of July 5th, 2015, Brooks met with Crystal's mother, and they both then realized together, hey, we need to go and file a missing persons report. Crystal's mother said Brooks didn't appear too concerned, and all he said was, well, yeah, you probably should do that. He didn't offer to report her missing. He so far hadn't reported her missing, and he lived with her, and he had their child with him. Later on that day, I think it was around 5 p.m., so just a few short hours after Crystal was reported missing, her car was found on the Bluegrass Parkway near Mile Marker 14, and the way in which her car was found was incredibly suspicious. Roger's father and brother found her car Sunday about 12 miles from the boyfriend's house. The car had a flat tire. Her purse and phone were still inside. In fact, the keys were still in the ignition. Now, everything about this was so incredibly suspicious because Crystal had no reason to be in this area. All the places she would have been, including all of Brooke's family, all of her family, were in the complete opposite direction of where her car was and where she seemed to be heading so it was just incredibly suspicious and this is when everyone well at least crystal's side of the family realized something was very very wrong now brooks was the last person to see crystal so he was one of the first ones to be questioned and this was a wild ride and if you happen to have a couple of hours to an entire day to watch these interviews that i'm about to get into i highly suggest you do it you learn a lot about people's mannerisms um, you know, it's just, it's very interesting. The interrogations do tell such a big story, and while there are a lot of interrogations online, not a lot of the cases I've covered have had them, so very interesting. I will leave them linked down below. When authorities contacted Brooks and questioned him, he gave his entire story of what happened the last night that he saw Crystal. But in this story, he contradicted himself quite a few times and conveniently did not remember a lot of information. So on the 8th of July, just three days after Crystal technically was labeled a missing person, and about five days since she was last seen, they brought Brooks in to be interviewed at the police station. And he gave his side of the story and what events occurred that night. Now, Brooke said that he had a very busy day that day. He normally does. He's taking care of all these different rental properties. He's helping out at his mother's farm. So he's incredibly busy. So he said at around 5 p.m. is when he got home. He said that him and Crystal, and I think one of the daughters was actually there as well, had a very simple dinner and they left the daughter behind to be picked up by, I think, her grandmother on her father's side. So they left and he started explaining the whole babysitter situation. They apparently, according to Brooks, did take their youngest son, Eli, with them. He said that the other kids had been having some jealousy issues and, you know, Crystal was still taking care of this little baby. It was a younger baby. You tend to take 
you know, really young children with you pretty much anywhere you go. You don't normally get a babysitter. You can just throw them in with you and they tag along. But the other kids were very jealous of this and it was causing some issues. So they just told the kids, according to Brooks, that they were getting a babysitter and that's why they were going to their father's houses um you know just so they wouldn't have this jealousy issue and say hey you're bringing the baby but you're sending us off somewhere like why would you do that so he claims that's why this happened but then police confronted him about the fact that crystal even said herself that she was getting a babysitter that night and he claimed he didn't know why she would say that that they were on the same page that there wasn't a babysitter it was just a cover so that's kind of one of the first very suspicious things and the reason why a lot of people think that's suspicious is because that baby kind of acts as an alibi in a way even though it's a two and a half year old and that child obviously doesn't know anything or remember anything if you have a child there it gives this impression that obviously nothing bad can happen there's this innocent kid there a lot of people were questioning this including authorities and they ended up contacting the sitter that i think brooks said would have babysat eli and the sitter said she had no plans of doing that but again you know, Crystal could have planned it or it could have been someone else and he lied about that. You just never really know, but, but that's definitely one of the most suspicious things in this entire story. So, after that, he says they left the house at around 7 p.m. and went to the farm, which is about 20 minutes away. So this put them there at about 7.20ish. And he said they got out to feed the livestock and just spent a few hours there. But he was captured on security footage, leaving again about 15 to 20 minutes after he originally arrived at the farm. And when police asked him why he left again, he said he was just going to the feed store. And on his way there, he realized that they were probably closed. So he turned around and went back. This is another bit of information people are questioning because I'm pretty sure he would have gone to the feed store to get it on the way to the farm. It doesn't make much sense that he gets there and then leaves and then comes back. And he goes there often enough to know when they need feed and he still fed the cows according to him. So it's not like they were out and it was a necessity to go and pick this stuff up. So a lot of people are questioning this as well. So he gets back and then he claims, you know, him and Eli and Crystal are feeding the cows. And then he says that they took a walk up one of the roads and came back and then decided to leave between 11 p.m. and 12 a.m. He then says that they went home. It's again another 20 minute drive back home. He said when he got there, it was obviously late. So he went to bed, but Crystal stayed up playing games on her phone. He says when he woke up the next morning at around 6 a.m. July 4th, 2015, Crystal was not there and it was just Eli in the bed beside him. So police started asking why he didn't immediately call her, try to figure out what's going on. They haven't released phone records and when he did call her, but from their questions, I'm assuming it definitely wasn't right away. I don't even know if he called her more than about two times that day. He claimed that him and Crystal had kind of a rocky relationship and things were a little strained at times. So when she needed to cope with one of their fights, arguments, you know, times where they're not great, she would go over to her cousin's house, hang out with her sister, some of her friends, and do something called a fantasy party. I'm not exactly sure what that is or what that means, but he said they would have these fantasy parties and she would just be away for like a day, a day and a half. So he claimed she would, you know, leave for the night, late at night to do this. However, he also went on to say that most of the time when they did this, he was the one that would watch everyone's kids. But for some reason, this time she never told anyone. So authorities were questioning the fact that she would just leave in the middle of the night and not tell anyone. She wouldn't have intentionally disappeared. Um, me and her was really close. Anytime that they would have gotten to an argument or, you know, she would have took a minute to leave, she would have texted me. Um, she would have let me keep, you know, kept the baby. She wouldn't have left him. And also in him giving this reasoning for not being worried, he kind of admitted to there being some sort of argument the night before, which he failed to mention to police earlier on in his statement. So it was almost like he was creating a reason for her to be gone based on a normal reason she would be gone, but not realizing the key factors behind it completely and just left out this entire portion of his storyline and just made himself look a lot more suspicious. So authorities started asking him a little bit more about 
how his weekend went, you know, how he spent his time when the mother of his child and his girlfriend that he lived with just didn't come home. So he said he woke up early that Saturday, got himself ready, and then he went out to the farm. And he said he just kind of messed around for a little bit. And then he said later on he ended up going to a 4th of July party, which he'd already mentioned before, and he was actually planning to go to it with Crystal, but she wasn't home. So authorities then asked him because little did he know they had already gone out to the property and saw that one of the bulldozers on the farm had recently been used in some sort of rocky gravel area. So they asked him about this and all of a sudden he remembers that he did work on this area by the barn that had an issue with flooding. And then he started talking about how, you know, he went out there in the morning and just piddled around. Then they started asking what he did with his son while he was operating this heavy machinery because again, he said he had his son this entire time, the night before and that morning. And he said that while he was operating a bulldozer, he had his son over playing with a tricycle. Besides the fact Fact that that is obviously a safety hazard for the child that could be a possibility but you know again this brings a little bit of questionable information to his story because he didn't mention using this heavy machinery at first and the more they started giving him details about how they found it then he had a reason behind it so again just more suspicious authorities then started asking him if he burned things frequently on the property which on a farm is very very common like sometimes multiple times a day they'll burn their trash that's not an uncommon thing and he said he did however he didn't know that dogs had actually alerted to one of the piles of burning debris um, and before he knew that he also admitted to starting a fire that Friday night so the Friday night that he was last known to be with Crystal, which again is suspicious. So they started digging deeper into this, asking when he started the fire, and again, he started conveniently not remembering things. He didn't know if he burned it before or if he burned it after. It's almost like he had all these details when he was telling the story, but then when he was questioned about something in specific that he didn't realize could be connected to something, then he started backing down and not remembering anything. Folks didn't realize that authorities had already really started their own timeline. I mean, they hopped on this case like no other so I want you guys to realize it's not like all of these suspicions came up out of nowhere from the second all of this started from the second they knew she was missing people were suspecting something happened to her and that her boyfriend was very possibly involved in it and their own timeline that they had started creating wasn't matching up with Brooke's timeline so I said before that they had security footage and I don't know if Brooks was aware of this or not but his aunt lived at the very end of the road that the farm was on and they had security footage that caught who came in and out of the driveway of the farm now Brooks was seen Again, like I said, going in at around 7.15, 7.20, and you're not really able to see if there's anyone in the car with him. And then he left again 15 or 20 minutes later, but then he didn't leave the farm until 11.55 p.m. So they started asking him why they kept their son up this late. You know, are you sure he was with you? Was he asleep in the car for a while? That's really late for a kid to be up. So Brooke started explaining that Crystal was a night owl. She was the kind of person that liked to go to bed really late and sleep in really late and Eli was the kind of kid where if everyone in the house wasn't asleep and all the lights weren't off he was going to stay up and this is something very very possible because I have two kids like that my kids will literally stay up until like three in the morning if you let them if they know you're outside awake and you're moving around they have FOMO, like they do not want to miss out and they want to be with you. So in answering this little bit of information that, you know, it was normal for him to be up that late because Crystal, you know, went to bed late and slept in very late, he unknowingly popped up another question and suspicion in authorities' minds. If Crystal stayed up that late and was up even later than you were past possibly 12.30 a.m. and slept in late, why didn't you think it was suspicious when she wasn't there at 6 a.m.? And again, he didn't really have a good answer for that. Now, if you know that your girlfriend or your wife or your spouse or anyone, you know, goes to bed super late and sleeps in super late unless they have a very specific reason for getting up, if you woke up and they weren't there, that's like instant panic. At least that would be my reaction. I know when I'm asleep in bed with my husband, you know, if he gets up and goes into our daughter's room or can't sleep and goes out on the couch for a while, I wake up and he's not there. It's 
it's like panic because you know normally when someone's there you know their routine if you've been with them for three and a half possibly four years like this guy had been with Crystal you know these things so you know, you can't say they do something very specific and then also say that you're not concerned at all enough to even call family or police when you wake up early in the morning and that person's not there. Authorities then asked about a 13 second phone call that came into Brooke's phone right at midnight on the night that they supposedly left the farm. So not even five minutes after they left. And he claimed he couldn't remember who the phone call was from. So they made Brooks call the phone number back. And when he called back, the person who had called him that night answered. He said, hey man, you know, I, I don't remember a phone conversation the other night. Can you remind me? And this man said, yeah, I called you to ask about a rental property. I needed a number for a rental property. And he was like, okay, yeah, you know, that's what I thought. You know, what did I say back to you? Because authorities wanted to know this conversation. And the man said back, you told me that you had to call Crystal in order to get the phone number and that you'd call me back the next day. So why would he have to call Crystal five minutes after they supposedly left the farm together? Now his explanation for this is again a logical one. You know, it was late at night. You know, she might not want to deal with that. She might not have had her books or something with her. I don't know if she kept it in her phone all the different rental property numbers, all sorts of things. So it's very possible it was just too late and they just didn't want to deal with it. But why not say that? Why say I have to call her if she's right there beside you? The rest of the interview was equally as strange. He didn't remember exactly what he did at the farm that morning. He didn't remember phone calls he got that morning. He didn't remember if he left to go home and shower that day. He didn't know how he got to the party. And then all of a sudden he remembered his mom took him. And you guys, I understand that people are forgetful. I am honestly one of the most forgetful people in the entire world, not joking at all. But this was days before. This wasn't weeks before, even a week before. It was days before this interview, you know? And it wasn't just a random day. Obviously, it's hard to remember random days. It's easy to remember a day where you woke up and your girlfriend was mysteriously gone when, you know, it was the 4th of July, a fun day for most people with lots of family events. Like, I can remember the past, like, three or four 4th of Julys, and I have a bad memory but he couldn't remember anything. And then things got even more suspicious. I don't know how many times I'm going to say suspicious in this video, but it's probably going be, to be way too many, so don't call me out on it. But part of the way through Brooke's interview, his phone rings, and the person on the other end of the line was his brother, Nick. Now, Nick works for Bardstown Police Department, so he called his brother in the middle of an interrogation as a police officer of that area. So that's like a huge no. Basically, the whole phone call seems very scripted and planned. And Brooks the entire time is repeating every single thing that Nick says, almost like he wants to make sure the investigator hears it. Sure. Hello? No. I, I'm, up, I'm up here, I know that you didn't know, I'm up here in this interview with uh, the detective, Detective Snow. I've been up here a good little while. I, I'm filling out this, uh, this statement here and everything. Do, is it, do, are you telling me that's? Are you telling me that's what I need to do? I know. I, I know. I don't. I know. I, I, I'm not. I know that. But the way that I look at it is, I, I'm innocent. I ain't done nothing wrong. What you know? I know you've told me innocent people have got jammed up, but if you're telling me to leave, I'll get up and leave. If you want me, if you want me to. I know I'm going through a lot, but I'm trying to get this guy to help me. I don't think she, I don't think she's ran off with some other guy. I don't, I don't believe that. You can't make me think that. No. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, so, I mean, so, so do I. I'll do exactly what you're telling me to do right now. Do you want me to get up and leave? Man, I don't think these guys. I don't think, I don't think these people have got it vindictive just to, to skin me for no reason. Man, this is not their family. This is not. He thinks y'all are a little fuck is what he thinks. I don't know who he is. Nick, my brother. Is he going to tell you? No, I, I know that, but I, I'm not. He just said just to just to keep sitting up here, he said, give, give a statement, do an interview, whatever I got to do, do it. But he said, no, I'm just to keep just letting them just beat you to death over this right here. Just ask what you got to ask and let, you know. I, and you tell me. You see what I'm, you see what, I mean, he knows more about this than I do. You see. And, and have I, listen, have I told you? that I'm for you? Yes, you have. I said, what did I say? My job is to find Crystal. It was almost like they wanted to, you know, create this scene, create this story, and make the investigator feel a very certain way. And then the interview ended and the case moved on. Authorities brought out dogs to the area that the car was found in, and the dogs ended up not being able to pick up Crystal's scent. They got some items from Brooks himself from the home that he knew would smell like Crystal, and they gave the dogs this scent took them out to the location and nothing. Her car had a flat tire, but she had triple A, so if she needed help, she could have called for it. Her phone was dead and you know, that's not something that's very odd to me. The car and phone possibly could have been sitting there for about two days. I'm sure a phone could have died in that time frame just from sitting there. She wouldn't have really had a reason to get out of the car again because she had AAA. She wouldn't have had to walk anywhere and everyone that knew her knew that's not something she would do to begin with. And even if she had gotten out of the car to check to see what tire was flat or maybe to get in the car of someone that was picking her up, the dogs would have tracked her scent, you know, from her getting out of the car to wherever she ended up and nothing. It was like she had never even been there. Let's say the phone had been dead. The last time she was seen, according to Brooks, she was playing games on her phone and we all know that drains the battery so incredibly quickly. First of all, her family said there's no way she would have left the house and left her child behind knowing her phone was going to die. Again, second of all, she wouldn't have even been going in that direction anyways. The place that she went with her cousin was in the exact same neighborhood she lived in. If the phone was dead, she wouldn't have been able to call anybody. And from what I've seen, there is no sign that she tried to call AAA, something that she had, or made any phone calls. But again, since phone calls have not been released, I could be wrong on that. But let's just say her phone did die and she was relying on a stranger did she just get picked up by the wrong person but what are the chances of that and again the dogs would have smelled her everyone is fairly certain at this point that this car was planted there and she was never ever there so somehow her phone got from the last place it was seen in her home to her car in this random location and no one knows how. People started questioning if maybe the dogs got it wrong, you know, maybe the dogs just didn't pick up her scent. But that was ruled out fairly quickly because they then tried to track where she would have gone. I don't know if it was from her home or from somewhere along the way from her home to the farm and sure enough, the dogs tracked her scent the exact route that Brooks said they took. So right down all the same roads he took and straight to the farm. And the dogs had never been there before. The dogs are not told to go a specific way. They literally led everyone on the same path to the farm. So they knew the dogs, knew the scent, and could track her. They just couldn't because she was never at the car. Authorities then decided to bring Nick in, Brooke's brother, and for pretty good reason. First of all, he had called his brother in the middle of an interview with police. And second of all, because they had proof that he met with his brother shortly afterwards and that he had a phone conversation with his brother right before his brother's interview on the 8th. So basically on the 8th, right before the interview, they had a short conversation. His brother called multiple times during the interview and then two hours afterwards, they had footage that showed Brooks driving into the farm and Nick was driving right behind him, like following directly behind him. And there were even multiple witnesses that came forward that saw them driving all the way to the farm. So it's not like this wasn't a planned thing. For some reason, they were out at the farm until about midnight and then they both left at the same time as well. And for this to happen on the day that 
you know, Brooks was interviewed is incredibly strange. So Nick's entire interview was very strange and suspicious as well. He spent the entire time trying to convince these investigators that he didn't know Crystal very well, that they had only seen each other a handful of times, that he didn't even talk to his brother ever, despite the fact that I'm pretty sure they lived on the exact same street. Um, it was just a very strange thing. They kept trying to distance themselves from each other. Both of their main points, and if you guys go watch their interviews, again, they're two hours long each. It's going to take a while. The entire time, they're really trying to distance each other. They act like they don't talk, like they, you know, don't communicate, yet somehow they're talking in the middle of their interrogations and they're meeting each other out at the barn and you know it's just very very strange. Nick said he couldn't even remember how he found out that Crystal was missing and again this is a pretty big deal. You don't just forget when someone that's basically your sister-in-law goes missing. This is a big family event but he couldn't remember. He also said that Brooks never called him in any of those days and talked to him about what was going on. He didn't know any of the details around Crystal's disappearance, but somehow, you know, he felt obligated to call his brother multiple times during his interview. Um, and in the interview, as you saw, he basically told his brother like to not talk to them, that they were trying to pin things on him. And basically he risked his career and he, you know, I'll get more into that later, over this for someone that he apparently never talked to and for a case he didn't know anything about. So again, not even a week since all of this happened and yet another person can't seem to remember anything. He said it was a coincidence that he followed his brother to the farm. He didn't remember and neither did his brother why they were at the farm. Both of them didn't remember seeing each other even though one was following the other. There was one point where Nick actually pulled over and stopped and waited for his brother to catch up. You know, conveniently, Nothing wiped clean out of their mind. Then a bomb was dropped. The day after Brooke's interview on the 8th, so the 9th, Nick's cruiser was confiscated. I think the chief or someone showed up to his house, said they had to take his car and off they went. Now, Nick had a pretty good idea what was happening with his car, but they didn't tell him and they did in fact take it in to be analyzed. And what they found was shocking to say the very least. So in Nick's interview, they started asking him what he kept in his car. He said, you know, he kept it fairly clean. In the back, he just had a box. It had typical things like, you know, flashers, flashlight, um, fire extinguisher, you know, any cases he's working on, just things like that. Um, and you know, he goes on and on and on and on about these small items in this box and they start asking him, you know, are you sure there's nothing else? Like, are you sure there's nothing else that would have been in there? And it almost seems like he finally feels pressured to say, well, yes, there actually was a blanket in there. So he goes on to talk about moving. In the beginning of his interview, he told authorities he had moved into a new home about two or three weeks ago, meaning he moved at the end of May to around July 1st. And, you know, he did have a date that was set for him to be out. They didn't release this date um, because I'm sure it's important, but he said he had to have a blanket because he needed to move things, didn't want to scratch the finish. Um, if you've moved before, you know they offer those moving blankets. But instead, he just went to the farm and found one in one of, I think, like the shed type of houses. Um, and he said he took it from the farm and he used it to move. And he said when he was done, he just threw it in the back of his cruiser and he planned to take it back. Now, apparently, it never got back to the farm because... When they looked in the back of his car, they found this blanket, they sprayed everything with luminol, and in the investigator's words, the trunk lit up like Chernobyl. Um, so if you're not aware of what luminol is, <laughs> luminol detects bodily fluid. I've talked about it before. Usually they use it to find blood, but it pretty much finds any bodily fluids. So some sort of bodily fluid was all over the trunk and the blanket and Nick had no idea how it got there. There had only been one other officer that had used that particular patrol cruiser and he had no reasons for it to be there. You know, he, someone would have had to thrown up all over the back of his trunk. He would have had to store evidence in there and before they told him what they found, he said that he's never done that before. He's never kept evidence in his trunk. Um, someone would have had to pee in his trunk, you know, or someone bleeding would have had to have been in this trunk. 
They obviously tested all of this. They knew it was someone's DNA and they did in fact match all of the different spots in the trunk where DNA was found to the blanket. So whatever was on the blanket was also the other spots in the trunk, making it pretty safe to say that something was in there at the same time as both of these. And since the blanket was used to move, that means the time frame this bodily fluid got onto all of these items you know, was between the very end of May, around July 1st, to then. So the exact same time frame that Crystal Rogers went missing. Now they haven't released if they matched the DNA to Crystal's, I've got my own theories on this. I think it's very likely they have. And because I think they got results back in 2015, early 2016, that means it's been a couple of years now. And they haven't released it, which says one of two things to me. Either the DNA did match Crystal and they are keeping this as their lottery ticket to charging whoever they eventually charge. They just don't have enough information and they don't want to release it to possibly ruin their own investigation. Or the less likely option in my own opinion is that it didn't match. But I feel like if it didn't, they would have come out and said that. Um, you know, normally though, when you see cases like this where they test DNA, you know, they find an answer and then they give an answer almost immediately one way or the other unless there's just not enough information and they need to keep it for safekeeping which personally is what I think is happening here. Fire extinguisher that he went on and on about as well was also not in the car which again is suspicious because the dogs alerted to the fire pit basically at the farm and Brooks admitted to having multiple fires and the fire extinguisher is missing. Could that also just be, you know, he used it at some point and forgot that he used it and didn't replace it? Yes, possibly, but he didn't remember when the last time he used a fire extinguisher was. He didn't remember what happened to it. Um, and I mean, again, I think you would remember using a fire extinguisher, especially when you're an officer, you remember everything that's in your car. You don't forget what's in your squad car. And then more witnesses started coming forward. And while they did, both Brooks and Nick were given polygraphs and they both were given a polygraph test by the FBI. Brooks' test results were inconclusive and Nick, failed and the questions that he failed on were all the ones that were asked regarding if he knew where Crystal Rogers was. Now again, I don't personally put a lot of weight into polygraph tests. I know a lot of people think it's great science and this and that, but there are a lot of different factors involved that can totally switch up your results to a polygraph test. I was doing a lot of research into it when I was, you know, specifically looking into this case. So could that mean nothing? Yes. Could it mean something along with everything else? Also possibly yes. So Nick's neighbors ended up coming forward saying that they saw him move something from the trunk of his car into his mother's car on the 10th. So Brooks interviews on the 8th, his squad car is taken on the 9th, and then on the 10th, he is moving some strange item out of the trunk of his car into his mother's car. Now, that alone, not suspicious. We know witness testimonies, they're not always correct. They're actually usually most of the time incorrect. However, in this particular case, a lot of witnesses came forward, not even knowing each other, with different pieces that backed the other witnesses' statements, if that makes sense. So, Keith Rogers, that same night on the 10th, he came forward and said at around 8.30 that night, he went over to Crystal and Brooke's house to get clothes for the kids because he was taking care of them. And he said while he was there, Brooks received a phone call and this phone call was from Nick. Now, I don't know if Brooks and Nick's mother was there or if after Brooks got off the phone, he called their mother. But either way, he said to their mother, Nick needs help, we have to go to his house. And then he just kind of took off. So on the same night someone sees a suspicious item being transferred from a trunk to the mother's car, is the same night another totally unrelated witness hears this phone call that Nick needs help and the mother and Brooks is involved. Very, very suspicious. Just days after this all happened, a warrant was served to search the 240 to 300 acre farm that belonged to the 
Houck's family. Not much has been said about the search. As I said, I think they are trying to build a very, very strong case because a lot of this might be circumstantial. So a lot of the details of these searches and everything are still very hush hush. But we do know that they brought around 14 plus cadaver dogs. I'm pretty sure county and state police were there and I'm almost positive FBI was there. Don't quote me on that. But the only thing that we know, according to Crystal's family, is that they saw some sort of farm equipment being taken away. So is that the bulldozer that they questioned Brooks about? I don't know. All I know is that they had some sort of reason to take it. Did they test it with luminol? Um, did a dog alert to it? I wish we had that information. The following September, Nick was actually suspended from the Bardstown Police Department and there apparently were like 300-ish pages as to why. He had interfered with a police investigation by knowingly calling his brother in the middle of being interrogated. Apparently there were a lot of other illegal things he did stemming from the Crystal Rogers investigation. And then in October of 2016, he was officially fired from the police department. And they said he lost his job because as an officer, you, you know, have a sworn duty. You are supposed to protect and serve and you are supposed to cooperate and he seemed to be doing none of those and they said he couldn't even live up to the basic standards of being a police officer and he was interfering and not cooperating with police he had told his brother not to cooperate um, he did come in for interviews but you know when they asked him to come in the first few times he said no the police chief had to go up to him and basically tell him he had to go and be interviewed he had agreed to a polygraph test and then refused to it when the day came around until again the police chief showed up with the fbi and essentially like told him he had no choice he needed to go and do it he was being very uncooperative and as a police officer that's not what you're supposed to be doing so he was dismissed completely from bardstown police department and then in 2015 about five months after crystal's disappearance a man named danny singleton was indicted for 38 counts of perjury after giving false testimony before a grand jury in regards to crystal's case so singleton was a longtime friend of Brooks and a former employee. He did know Crystal. Crystal every once in a while would give him rides to and from work, but overall he was just a friend of both of theirs. But on July 4th, the morning that apparently Brooks woke up and didn't see Crystal anywhere, at 7 a.m. that morning, Singleton called him, and I guess there was some suspicion around this phone call. Again, not a lot's been released on it, but Basically, authorities believed it was very possible he had something to do with Crystal's disappearance. You know, did she go to try to give him a ride? Did he take her car, do something with her and drop her car off in the middle of nowhere? There was just a lot of speculation going on. And then two men actually came forward and in their statement said that they knew that Singleton had murdered Crystal. But none of this was actually true. And one year later, around January 2016, the two men that made these accusations against Singleton came forward and said that they had actually lied about it. And they were charged with false reporting on a crime. Um, you know, this honestly makes you wonder if these two men were hired to say something about this suspicious old man or maybe this old and he was maybe thrown into it just because he happened to know Crystal or you know obviously 38 counts of perjury involving her case Singleton in some way was involved were they all involved in it it's just really weird to me because it just seems like this random team effort a year later to get the case closed and quiet and someone away for it so people stop paying attention to it. Crystal's family personally believes that Singleton does know at least something about what happened and they're hoping his time in jail will get him to say something. But I don't know, I'm not convinced personally that he knows anything, but again, I don't know what all these counts of perjury are for. I don't know 
what that revolves around, but I guess eventually that will come out. And then tragedy hit the family once again. There had been searches and so many investigations, so many people spoke in front of the grand jury, but Crystal's case seemed to be moving at a snail pace. They just couldn't seem to find what they needed to find. And one of the main driving forces behind the background search for Crystal that was done by the family because Brooks to this day has never participated in a search and never tried to help was Crystal's father, Tommy Ballard. And on November 2016, Tommy along with his 12 year old grandson left on his property to go hunting. And when he was about to enter the woods, he was shot straight in the chest and died instantly. Well, Rick, state police, as you know, have labeled this a death investigation, but family is adamant this was murder because Tommy Ballard, they say, was getting close to finding out exactly what happened to his daughter. Now with a $20,000 reward on the table, they're hoping to get some answers. I think they walked the fence line yeah. to Tommy's land. They knew where it was and I think crossed the fence. 10, 15 feet across right there in the wood line, and I think they shot him when he got out of his truck. They were waiting on him. His death was initially seen as an accident, but everyone knew there was absolutely no way. The way he was shot was so precise. It killed him right on the spot. No one came forward, you know, saying, hey, I was hunting and I accidentally shot him. But then authorities started to believe it wasn't an accident because Tommy had recently come to his wife and told her that he was being followed. And they were able to back this up because he had just recently installed a camera in his truck to watch someone that was tailing him. So he had reason to believe someone was following him and you know if someone saw him leave his house early that morning they were watching him or he had a routine of going you know out hunting early in the morning they easily could have been set up and ready. You know I'm sure he entered the same spot when he went hunting maybe to go to a blind or something like that and they were there and they were waiting. I mean a shot to the chest perfectly to kill someone instantly. I mean, you could be a great hunter, but if you are shooting something that you think is a deer and it's someone standing up, what are the chances that you're gonna hit that person in such a perfect spot that you kill them instantly? It definitely was no accident and everyone in the family knew that whoever killed Tommy probably was also the same one who had something to do with Crystal's disappearance and probable murder. Whoever did whatever they did to Crystal would have great motive for wanting to get rid of Tommy because as I said, her dad was the driving force of everything. They had made shirts to wear to make sure people remembered her face and remembered her story and he didn't take it off unless he was going to church. They even ended up burying him in one of the shirts. He wasn't letting anyone forget. If a lead came in that he himself could check up on, he would do it. He organized all of the searches and one of the biggest searches they had set to date, he had organized and was set to happen just a few days after he was shot in the chest. And if that's not suspicious, I don't know what is. And everyone thinks, you know, this search, maybe it was too close. Maybe he was getting way too close to answers and Crystal and the person responsible and they had to get rid of him. Crystal's family continued putting up signs and you know, demanding that the public and police department didn't forget Crystal. And I personally have seen a lot of cases and I don't think the police department forgot Crystal. I just think it's one of those situations where they just keep a lot to themselves to protect the integrity of the investigation. But I can see how that would frustrate a lot of people who really just want answers. Crystal's family was also in a battle for visitation rights. Crystal and Brooke's son, Eli, because ever since Crystal went missing, Brooks wouldn't let the family see him at all. They planned different visits over and over and over again and he just wouldn't show so they had no choice but to take legal action. As I said before, Brooks wasn't offering to help search or put up signs or flyers or speak publicly or come to vigils or do anything and he kept saying to people, oh well it's because I'm working on things behind the scenes. But isn't every family of a missing person, aren't they all working on things behind the scenes with investigators and FBI and different police departments, you know, but they still make time to actively go out and search for someone. But the family, again, wouldn't give up and they had signs everywhere and after a while the signs got very, very blunt. They said things like, who murdered Crystal? There were a few signs that said, Brooks, Hauk, where is Crystal Rogers? Like calling him out directly, you know, 
all sorts of signs everywhere and the town discouraged them from putting up these signs. They, they said that it was affecting the tourism and people thought it was just a town full of murderers, but you know, the family was really just trying to make sure nobody forgot. I will say it was a little bit blunt, but you know, you do what you have to do. And then the signs at one point started going missing. They were being taken from people's yards who had paid you know, for their own sign to keep up. They were being taken from gas stations, you know, of people that knew the family ran businesses and put signs everywhere. People were finding them destroyed in fields or in dumpsters. And so they tried to figure out who was taking these signs down because again, that's suspicious. You know, if someone who people think has been murdered, if their signs are being stripped down and destroyed, who wants to keep something hidden? And they ended up actually tracing this person back to another girl named Crystal, but this was Brooke's new girlfriend named Crystal. She had been taking them down and destroying them, and this was a woman who was now romantically involved with a person of interest in this case, and that's just crazy to me, you know? While a lot of them did directly accuse him, you know, I understand taking those down because that's like really tarnishing someone's name that's not been proven guilty. But all of the other ones, why would you take those down? Why do you want all the attention in general taken away from this? And she did end up, you know, admitting that she did it and she was charged for it, but it was, it was just a mess. And, you know, to a lot of people, it seemed like the authorities had a lot of information, especially on the brothers they had searched multiple houses multiple times, brought in so many cadaver dogs, had announced that they found some sort of DNA, and the fact that somehow that brought no answers, people were screaming corruption. And I've said it already in this video, I don't think corruption is involved here. Um, honestly, I think everyone's trying to handle it the best way that they can and protect the integrity of the case. And I get how it's so frustrating when it seems like they have all the answers, but you've got to remember in situations like this that you've got one shot to bring whoever is guilty down. And if they somehow manage to escape, if you don't, if you don't bring every shred of evidence that you have found, and I mean, you're bringing 100% damning evidence that this person did it, they can escape and there will never be justice. You cannot retry someone for the same thing. You know, it, it just, it's a very sensitive situation. You know, I don't think corruption's involved. It's just, they're doing what they can. Alex's grandmother has even been a subject of court hearings. She wasn't really involved in a lot of this investigation until after Crystal's father was shot. Um, a suspicious car had been reported at the farm in the time frame that Crystal was reported missing and no one really knew where this car came from. They couldn't identify it. And then they found out that the car that people were describing was actually a white Buick that was owned by Brooks and Nick's grandmother. Authorities believed that this white Buick was used to dispose of a body and then cleaned up and sold. And they believe this was done to prevent them from getting the last little bits of evidence that they would need to probably prosecute. It was a big mess with the grandmother. I think she was about 84, 85 years old when this was going on. And you know, they were trying to get her to testify, but she was an elderly woman. Her memory's not that great you know, not in the best health condition. Um, and you know, they needed her to testify. They needed her to talk about this car and you know, what happened, who had it, why she sold it, when she sold it exactly, if the brothers ever used it. Um, but she actually ended up pleading the fifth to not self-incriminate. And then when they finally got her in there, um, she asked for like a private hearing basically. And they decided then and there that everything she ever said would be sealed and confidential. They most recently searched her property in July of 2017, specifically looking for bullets and reloading equipment. And I am not 100% savvy on guns or anything like that, but from my understanding, with reloading equipment, you basically make your own bullets. And according to some people involved, this wasn't actually about Crystal. It was about her father, Tommy. So obviously, I think all of our thoughts are going in the same direction. I personally believe that authorities have the bullet that killed Tommy. And 
There's good reason to believe that whoever killed Tommy was responsible in Crystal's disappearance. And I believe they think they can match this bullet with possible, you know, bullets made with this reloading equipment. So, you know, it has its own markings, it has its own character traits. And if they're able to do that, it's a pretty safe bet that whoever used that equipment and if it was at the Hauk family home, it was probably one of the Hauks. They can prove that this is what was used and these are the people that possibly murdered Tommy and that in turn could help solve Crystal's case. That's to me what the obvious direction is that this is going in. But again, nothing has been confirmed. At the end of March this year, Crystal's family actually went forward to raise awareness for missing persons and murder cases at the state capitol because 53% of homicides and 50% of missing persons cases in the state remain unsolved. And that is a very large portion of unsolved cases. They're hoping that they can work with the state to kind of get this number down and keep these people in everyone's memories because again, just in Bardstown, Kentucky, there were how many unsolved murders and a missing persons case and in such a short period of time. And you know, the way that a lot of these people died was so incredibly brutal. And then to mark the anniversary of her disappearance, family members put balloons on Bluegrass Parkway where her car was. They hope that someone that year was driving through for 4th of July. It was vacation. People would have been using that road and maybe if they see the balloons, they'll connect it to something they saw happening around a vehicle that year and they'll realize, wow, I witnessed something that day and I can call in and talk about it. This past year, they actually also did a caravan as well where they drove through the city, including by the Houck's family homes, um, honking their horn and with signs to get everyone to remember, hey, Crystal is still missing and someone here has the answers. They ended their caravan at St. Thomas Parish where they then held a vigil for Crystal. In May of 2017, just months before that caravan and vigil, state police announced that they had assigned two troopers to look into all of the Bardstown murders and disappearances. That includes Jason Ellis, Kelly Netherland, and her daughter, and Crystal and her father. And again, I'm only speaking on Crystal and her father. I can cover the others if you guys would like to hear about them. But that means that two people are constantly digging into these cases and constantly trying to find answers. With normal police departments, you know, all these officers and detectives are on multiple cases and it's a constant flow of things coming in. Obviously they have no choice but to help all these people in these cases and look at all of them as equal as they can. But unfortunately, when you can't put 100% effort into every single case, things slip to the side and you forget and people aren't looked into as much as other people and that's just the nasty fact of how this all kind of plays out. So hopefully these two investigators on it are building up the biggest, strongest case they possibly can. I think authorities are working on this as hard as they can. You know, a lot of the times we see a police officer involved in something and the police department tries to take the person's side no matter what. And I think that's what a lot of people were worried about in this situation, but I'm just not seeing it. Even if you look at the interviews, these people are putting Nick through the ringer just like they would anybody else. I think it's just a matter of time before this all comes out. You know, there are plenty of theories in this case, mainly those revolving around the Hauk brothers and the Hauk family. It's very possible and a lot of people believe that the mother was watching the son that night and something happened to Crystal on that farm and she never left it. You know, whether it was unintentional, you know, maybe an accident after an argument, you get angry, you get heated, you push someone, they hit their head and then you cover it up, whether it was that or if it was something that was planned. I don't believe she left that farm and I don't think authorities believe she left that farm. I think someone planted her car there. I'd be very interested to know if um, the stem for the air valve on the tire that was flat was pulled out because if it was set up, someone had to set it up like there was a flat tire and make it look like she just got out and was taken by someone that drove by or you know, fell victim to foul play some other way. But if they believe it was planted, someone had to find a way to deflate that tire. And you can always slash a tire, but that's very obvious that it was slashed. 
you can you know put a nail in the tire but that's not a guaranteed flat within a couple of days when the car is found which would totally take away the reason why the car was there to begin with but if you take a stem valve out the air will come out period and you will have a flat pretty fast guaranteed so i'm very interested in that little bit of information because that could really verify that this car 100 percent was planted even though it pretty much seems that way anyways but you know there's no telling in this case the brothers are very suspicious there is a lot of strange activity going around that weekend it's very odd that they can't remember anything you know they can't remember these meetings they have on you know the day brooks is questioned the dna that's found in the back of the car um just very very strange but on the flip side let's say she was having an affair that and police have stated that they believe it's a possibility. Let's say she left that night and went to go see this person and that person tried to get her to leave Brooks and she didn't want to do it and they got angry. That person could equally be guilty of doing something to her. It could explain why her car is somewhere no one expected it to be. Obviously, if she's having an affair, she's not going to tell people about it so they wouldn't expect her to be in a location. Um, that this person might have lived at. Is this person possibly responsible? But you know, again, police have all the information that would back that up. They've said that they're pretty sure she had an affair and I'm sure they know who it's with at this point due to their level of investigation in this case. And since this person hasn't come out onto our radar, I doubt this person had any possible involvement if this person does exist. Something is just really not right here and I think a lot of people involved know a lot more than they want to say and now it's one big they cover up them to cover up them to cover up them. Um, and that's incredibly unfortunate and I really am hoping maybe somehow she's out there but I just don't see it as being possible. She left her kids, no one's heard from her. And she never went anywhere without them. She was pretty much a stay-at-home mom. She had never struggled with anything like depression, anxiety, any of that, or drugs. So there's just no reasoning. You know, we've talked about it before. That's obviously possible. But I just don't think based on the circumstances, that's what went down. But please, guys, let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Please remain respectful. And that's it, you guys. You know, hopefully, my hope is at least that they are building a case and it's just a matter of time before they find the right bit of information. I'm hoping someone might have something that they just forgot and they can call in and it will be, you know, the one last piece they need to solve this puzzle. I'm really interested to hear what you guys think about this. If you see another side of this, you know, that possibly explains all the strange behavior that I have missed, feel free to share it down in the comments below. Do you really think that Brooks and Nick just can't remember and that Brooks just expected her to come back and that's why he never called her in or seemed concerned or do you think he maybe had something to do with it he is their person of interest right now he is their suspect so at this point it is safe to say he could be guilty of something thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your day to hear about crystal's story this is something that i've been meaning to get to for a very long time and i finally had the time to sit down and really look through all of these different interrogation videos and all of the different information and try to piece it together. All the information, as always, is listed down below if you know anything about Crystal Rogers, her disappearance, her whereabouts, or what might have happened to her. Always call in, and you can always as well call in to Crime Stoppers. I'm going to go ahead and go. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. Hit the subscribe button to become a member of the Helen fam so we can hopefully bring them home together, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye, guys. Thank you.